Good morning and welcome. My name is Alan Moran. I'm a member of the Board of Transportation for NCDOT. I represent Dare County and the surrounding counties. Um, it's my privilege and honor to join you today to, uh, to honor the late Captain Richard Etheridge and dedicate the new P. Island Bridge uh, in his name and memory. Uh, Captain Etheridge was the first Ameri or African American to command a life saving station when he was appointed to be the keeper of the P. Island Life Saving Station in January of 1880. The Life Saving Station was credited for bravely saving the lives off the shores of the Outer Banks. Captain Etheridge was highly respected throughout the United States Life Saving Service for the rigorous life saving drills that he developed, which earned the P. Island Life Saving Station exemplary reputation. Uh, it was truly an honor to be here and to recognize him at the Life Saving Station. Uh, today we have many uh, government and elected officials here with us from various cities, towns, and counties. <clears throat> Since I cannot possibly recognize each of them individually, I'd ask all elected officials to please stand to be recognized. We also have numerous uh, members of the Armed Services and the Coast Guard here with us. We ask uh, for you, uh, you to stand so we could recognize you for your dedication and service to our country. Our first speaker is Robert Woodard, Chairman of the Dare County Board of Commissioners. Chairman Woodard, please join me. Thank you, Alan. Gosh, what an absolutely gorgeous day. It's February, folks. February. Um, welcome. I'm honored uh, that I have this opportunity on behalf of our Board of Commissioners uh, of taking part in the ceremonies today. I, uh, I rejoice at the consummation to which this day brings us in the completion and dedication of this bridge. It's a glad day for all true sons and daughters of the first flight state. Now Richard Estridge was born a slave on the beaches of North Carolina, P. Island, in January 16th, 1842. Now he grew up certainly knowing the tides and the currents and the channels and the shoals uh, of our coastline early on and he learned the savage power of those uh, oceans at a very young age. In January, as Alan said earlier, um, 1880, at the ripe old age of 38 years old, Afri African American Richard Etheridge was appointed to replace the ousted keeper of the station, 17, who like many outer bankers, uh, keepers, had really failed to respond to the ships in distress. Etheridge recruited and trained a crew of African-American surfmen, forming the only all-American station, African-American station, in the entire life-saving service. Now, depending on who you talk to along the Outer Banks, Richard Etheridge and his African-American crew were a curiosity back then. Before Etheridge had hired them on P. Island, the best African-American surfman could ever hope for in that time, in that era, was the lowest ranking position at a station. Oftentimes, the sixth person or even a substitute. Isolated from the rest of the crew, he'd be expected to cook, he'd do menial tasks, such as cleaning the gallery and tending the station ponies, if they had any at that time, except when a ship came in. Now, when a ship came in, then the African-American surfman would be right there in the surf boat with the others, stroking out to that wreck in high seas. Then, they would be there 
despite all of their humiliations at the time. To tell the true P. Allen story is to tell the story of Captain Richard Etheridge, the station's first keeper. When Assistant Inspector Frank Newcomb made the surprising and unlikely choice of Etheridge to run the station, he justified the decision by describing Etheridge as a man among men. He was certainly that and certainly more than that. The source of Etheridge's appeal has its roots farther back than the merely beginnings of his life-saving station service. It starts with his childhood in slavery, encompassing his experiences as a soldier fighting for freedom during the Civil War. When his leadership skills were forged and continued after his return from the battlefield. Now during an era with when African Americans were invisible, mostly despised, but always misunderstood by a larger society raging about the place of blacks within it. Etheridge was a beacon. He resisted the dehumiliation he thrived when forces compared him to limit his abilities. I could not think of a more appropriate way to honor Black History Month than to name this bridge. We're not at the bridge, of course, we're here. <laughs> but to name this bridge, we sure to could have been there today, Mr. Secretary, it's warm enough. The Captain Ether Richard Etheridge Bridge. It is my hope that every single time each of you drive across this bridge, that you take a moment and think about the legacy of Captain Richard Etheridge. And more importantly, it is vital that we share his story with every young person in Dare County in this complete state and world who may be in the vehicle at the time with you traveling across that bridge. The issues and challenges that our young people are facing today will profit from the many lessons that can be learned from the remarkable life of Captain Richard Etheridge. That is why the Dare County Board of Commissioners unanimously requested that we reach out to the Secretary and we reach out to our representative at DOT and name this bridge in honor of Captain Etheridge. We wanted our young people to be able to share in the legacy of this great man who became adversely and used his remarkable talent and leadership to serve others. Thank you on behalf of the Dare County Board of Commissioners for being here today for this joyous occasion. Thank you, Chairman, for the wonderful words depicting the life of Captain Etheridge. We would ask uh, Bobby Alton, County Manager of Dare County. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Um, when I come to these events, I'm usually not one of the speakers. Um, usually the more important folks get to do that. Um, but Dorothy asked me to speak today a little bit about the significance of the new bridge that we have here, the now Captain Richard Etheridge Bridge. Um, I look back to Hurricane Irene and I look around this room and I probably don't need to describe that to many people sitting in here. Uh, but we sat up at the north end on the north side of the, where the bridge is now and we looked out and we had two inlets coming through we had a big mound of pavement in the middle, and when you looked across the inlet, we had a house falling into the inlet, and the water was raging through there. And I thought, oh my God, and how helpless I felt. And all I could think about was, what are we going to do for these people down here who can't get on or off the island? How are we going to get them food? How are they going to get to the doctors? How are they going to be safe? You know, what are we going to do? And so. As things work out, it worked out. Um, DOT came in and 
30 or 60 days later, we had a Tinker Toy bridge that was a, a lifesaver to us. So I think about that a minute, and I think, well, how fitting is it now that we dedicate this bridge to somebody who spent their life saving and helping others, uh, who, who did the things, the selfless things, uh, that made life better for the mariners that go by, that was their life stream, much as this bridge has become the life spring for, for those of us that, that go and come from Hatteras Island. So I want to thank the family for lending us the name, uh, your name, uh, to go on that bridge. I know that every time I go over it, I'm certain that every time everyone from Hatteras Island rides over it, they'll think about one, how important that bridge is, but it'll also remind them of the selflessness of others to, to help and do things that need to be done uh, when people's lives are at peril and when people's safety uh, is in peril. So thank you uh, for lending that name and, and thank you to DOT for putting that bridge in for us. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce the Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Transportation, Mr. Jim Trogdon. Secretary Trogdon, if you join me. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, thank you uh, for your participation today and participation of all the Dare County elected officials. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to come back every time I come here uh, to the Outer Banks and Adair County uh, when it's not in problem solving mode it's always good to reflect how much we've done together and so this is a wonderful celebration today to honor Catherine Etheridge uh, but also really celebrate how much we've all done together and keep uh, doing for the service of our citizens here and the wonderful folks here in the Outer Banks. Nine years ago um, it, within a few months uh, Hurricane Irene uh, roared through the Outer Banks, opening the inlet where this bridge is uh, and cutting off the residents of Hatteras Island off from the rest of the state. Uh, most of us remember that day, and, uh, and as the uh, commissioner said, uh, we were out here looking at the damage, uh, deciding what's the best way ahead, what's the strategy. Um, and those are the moments that we uh, can reflect on that says, you know, this is the importance of NC-12. This is the importance of Hatteras Island. This is the importance of Dare County to our state. Uh, and so uh, not only when the connections are severed, uh, but also when we can come back and look at the progress we've made in response, that we know how important uh, these roads are, uh, and these facilities, uh, and these people are to our state. And so uh, we did act uh, fairly quickly. I think uh, within 36 hours, I had a a uh, contractor flying from, I believe, California at the time uh, in uh, because we had decided within 36 hours that the best way to solve this problem that we were facing was a temporary bridge, uh, finally referred to as a maybe, or what we refer to as a maybe Johnson Bridge, and folks here, Lego, Tinker Toy, all kinds of wonderful things, uh, but I think uh, it's all heartfelt, and that is, uh, you know, this is what we have to do. Uh, to first uh, maintain humility in the response of uh, devastating storms where we see the power of Mother Nature, maintain our duty uh, to our citizens, to our mission to, to provide transportation, whether it's through temporary bridges, through you know, um, uh, emergency ferry service, all of these things, this is our duty and we try to be resilient uh, while we do that because we know there will always be more challenges ahead. Uh, but uh, with the Lego Bridge, uh, I think everyone grew to love that, uh, and particularly I remember uh, fondly, I think it was the Thanksgiving Day Parade uh, where the Lego Bridge was featured uh, as a float. <laughs> Boy, how, how many places in North Carolina can you say that would happen? Uh, I can only think of one, uh, and that's here. So we were excited to get the bridge open, get all that work done. Uh, we're excited about the new bridge. Uh, its cost is about $14 million, and I believe everyone in the scheme of all the things that we build here in the Outer Banks uh, is a steal. Uh, we believe it's going to provide much uh, better service than our temporary bridge ever could, uh, even though we didn't anticipate it to stay in place as long as it did. We're glad that it did, and we would have kept it in place as long as it took. But we're glad that this one is open. 
Uh, but perhaps most importantly to the travelers, uh, not only is the better service bridge in place, but now you don't have to endure the uh, constant clankety clank uh, as you travel over the bridge. And this one will definitely keep travelers safe along the Outer Banks for many, many years to come. So like our duty in providing that service, uh, you know, providing our duty to this region, uh, providing the new bridge uh, in a very resilient uh, environment, uh, having to deal with lots of obstacles, but getting through those obstacles because uh, a, a, a predictable transportation and reliable transportation link is critical to this region. Very similar to what uh, Catherine Etheridge did in his job at Pea Island Life Saving Station. Um, 113 years before Irene, there was another unnamed hurricane that tore through this place. And despite those conditions, Catherine Etheridge and his men with humility, with duty, with resilience, uh, responded and worked to save all the souls on board the ship that had run aground not far from here, 113 years ago. I'll let the locals tell the story better than I ever could, but the bravery they exhibited that day was commendable, was one that deserves recognition by many others. And so we're pleased uh, to not only be able to name uh, this bridge, Catherine Etheridge Bridge, but also for the entire P Island Life Saving Station that exhibited such commitment to duty and resilience in such horrible conditions. So it's fitting uh, even a century later that this most historic event and this most historic individual will be recognized by our naming of this bridge and his role in keeping people safe along the coastline on a bridge that will keep people safe along the coastline. So from all of us at North Carolina DOT, we're proud to have the chance to participate in this honor and this legacy in such a way. And thank you once again for inviting me here today to join you uh, in this celebration. Thank you, Secretary Chogdon. Now for the final feature of today's program, uh, before the sign unveiling, the P. Island Preservation Society will be presented a program titled Freedmen, Surfmen, Heroes. This story is about unity and how Captain Richard Etheridge and the P. Island Lifesavers worked together with neighboring stations to save lives from the perils of the sea. The program has been presented over 15 times in the, over the past summer at the North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island and to every elementary school within Dare County. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation and I hope you all join me uh, welcoming the members of the P. Island Preservation Society. Thank you. These first three words are important. So I want you to say these three words as loud as you can. Now. Freedmen, servant, heroes. Freedmen, servant, heroes. Those words are really important to the story because they tell the story. Each of those words are, are, are very important to the message, and we want you to remember those three words. It's a true story. It's a unique story, and we know why. It's the story of Richard Etheridge and the Pea Island Lifesavers. It's a story also of black servants and white servant. A long time ago, when people did not expect it to occur, working together every day to save lives. It's a proud story, I always say, obviously for the area, it's a proud story for the state, it's a proud story for the nation. So thank you for being here. Everyone who lives here knows this picture. And this picture is really important to us. We love the Coast Guard. But did you ever stop to think, well, what was happening here before the Coast Guard? The Coast Guard wasn't formed until 1915. Well, there was an organization here, an organization called the United States Life Saving Service. 
created in 1871 and it lasted until 1915. And there were 300 life-saving stations all in the United States, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, around the Great Lakes. Their only function was to save lives in peril from the sea. Well, Richard Etheridge and the crew of the P.I. and the Life Saving Station were the only African American station of all of these stations. So, Daryl is going to come up next and he's going to tell you a little bit about Richard Etheridge's life. <laughs> Well, Richard Anthony was born on the beach at Bonnie Island in 1842. His mother, Rachel, dealt with a slave, owned by John B. Etheridge, a prominent family on Rhode Island. He operated a big co commercial fishing operation. Even though he was born a slave, he was treated as a slave. He lived in the Etheridge's house. He was raised up with John B.'s daughter and son. He taught him to read and write at a very young age, which was illegal in North Carolina back in those days. He was a product of child labor. He worked right beside John B., learned the commission first in operation, became an expert waterman. He learned to navigate the shallow waters of the sand through the inlets and the oceans. This prepared him later on, but he did not know that he eventually he'd become the first African American keeper in the United States Life Safety Service. Slavery is slavery, isn't it? Right. What's the first thing a slave wants? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom came to Rhode Island in February 1862. That's when the Union captured Rhode Island. Shortly after the capture, we were spreading around the inland of North Carolina, runaway slaves. If you can cross the creek to Rhode Island, you will find a safe haven. So runaway slaves came to Rhode Island, 1863. Freeman Colony was formed in Rhode Island. Land was issued out, houses were built, churches, hospitals, schools. Teachers came to the north, New England. And for the first time in their lives, the young and the old were taught to read and write. January 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all the slaves in all the states succeeded from the Union. It also allowed blacks to enter in the, in the Union Armed Forces. August of that year, 1863, Richard Etheridge and his best friend Bill Midget along with 98 other black men on Rhode Island joined the Union Army. They did their uh, basic training at Newburn, North Carolina, and for the first time in his life, he was examined by a doctor. Passed the physical, became part of the 36th North Carolina Colored Regiment, and he rose to the rank of sergeant. The first action they saw was in a place called well, the, the Richmond Campaigns, a place called New Market Heights, eight and a half miles south of Richmond. Two times before, the Union Army tried to capture the Heights and failed. But this time, 42,000 soldiers poised to attack the Union Heights that day. It was decided by General Benjamin Butler that the blacks would lead, spearhead the charge on the, on the heights that day. Five regiments, almost 5,000 black soldiers. The heights fell that day at a great cost. In less than a two hour battle, a thousand black soldiers were killed or wounded in that battle. During the Civil War, the uh, President Lincoln signed the, what was called the Congressional Medal of Honor. First time ever given out during the Civil War. Over 1,400 soldiers and, and sailors received that medal during the Civil War. 
16 of those men were issued to black troops in the Union Army. At the Battle of New Market Heights, 14 Medal of Honor were awarded at troops at the, at the Battle of New Market Heights. 14 out of 16. So he's had more of that battle up that day. April 8, 1865, Appomattox Courthouse, Lee surrendered to Grant. Six days later, Washington, D.C., Forge Theater. Everybody know what happened that day? Yeah. Lincoln was assassinated. Well, they survived the war. He and his best friend, Phil Midget, returned back to run up the island. They brought land, they farmed, they fished. Richard got married, had a child. Became active in the community. Became a county commissioner. Served on the Board of Education. At the time, the schools were integrated. You know, later on, the Jim Crow laws kicked in. Became segregated. Finally got his first job in the United States Life Saving Service at the Bali Island Life Saving Station, 1875. Tell us more about the United States Life Saving Service. Keeper James. Thank you very much. Every station had six guys, eventually eight that worked at the station known as the Serpent, and that was actually their rank, Serpent number one through eight. Um, one would be the most experienced, to have the most privileges, and most importantly, he was the next guy in line to be keeper. And in those days, in these very isolated places, being the keeper of a station like that was an extremely envious position. So you had to work your way up. Serpent number six, as we've already heard, was at the bottom of the barrel and had to work their way up. Although women were not allowed in the, uh, the life saving service they are today in today's Coast Guard, blacks were. They were called checkerboard crews. You might be able to see a you, one of these guys here. There weren't very many of them. But as we already found out, he's going to be the low man on the totem pole. And that's okay. He can work his way up. We thought. So we, we learned that. Richard Etheridge, when he left the Civil War and he gets his first job, he gets his job at the Body Island Life Saving Station. And he gets a job as surfman number six. And he works there about five years. Well, on January 24, 1880, while still number six surfman, a remarkable thing happens. And I don't think people appreciate it enough. He gets promoted from the lowest in rank to become the keeper of the P Island Station. Remarkable thinking what time that occurred to. The keeper of the P Island Station. These are quotes from two of the persons that recommended him. Charles Shoemaker said, you know what? Richard Etheridge was the best surfman on the coast. These are actually words in the historical record. Frank Newcomb said, Richard Etheridge was as good a surfman that is on the coast, black or white. Well, after Etheridge's appointment, this is another fact in the record, the white men at the station refused to work for him. Do you think that was odd? Probably not. When did this occur? This is in 1800s. Probably some would say that this was a mark against them if they even did that. Then the station burns down. Why do you think this happened? Probably jealousy, probably people, I mean after all, number six served when he gets to be keeper, he's African American too. That probably didn't go well with some people. Well, this did not stop Richard Etheridge and his crew. Etheridge formed an all-black crew and built a new station. He selected a couple of uh, people that worked at other stations. 
He selected a couple that were also known to be good, skilled watermen, and he formed his own black crew. That's how this station began to be an all-black crew. During construction, one of the people that had recommended him, one of the white inspectors, even camped out at the station to make sure that sabotage didn't occur again. The story is full of wonderful things, sad things, happy things, great things for us to hear. And the Pea Island Station went on after it was rebuilt to thrive. Every day, this lone African American station worked together with neighboring stations. The stations all often perform rescues together. When shipwrecks were spotted, they worked together as a team. They respected each other. They learned from each other. So next we're going to hear about their most famous rescue. The station responded to many, many shipwrecks. Each station did. Often uh, some stood out more than others. The one that you have heard a little bit about was this vessel right here. This is an actual photograph of a vessel that's in port in Providence, Rhode Island. October the 11th, 19, 1896, the E.S. Newman leaves port heading to the port of Norfolk, Virginia. A regular run, a real workhorse of a vessel, it is captained by Sylvester Gardner and his crew and two very special guests that keep the captain's wife and his three-year-old son, Tom. As they head down the coast, it was a beautiful day, weather calmly predicted. Unfortunately, as we well know here, things changed quickly, and that was the case that day as well. For the further they went down the coast, the worse the weather got, and the seas began to boil. And the captain, very seasoned, was not worried until, as he progressed further, the seas built until they completely lost track of where they were. They were heading to the port of Norfolk. They ended up off the coast of North Carolina. The seas had by this time and the weather had turned the course into a hurricane. This, the waves were high as in some instances as a three-story house. Not one, but many after the next. The wind so loud that the person standing next to them on this little vessel lost in that sea could not hear each other speak. In their last gasp effort, knowing that hope was love, they sent a flare. And they did that because they knew of the life-saving service. And their hope was that someone, wherever they were, might see that faint glare. And wouldn't you know that in the station P. Island, Thomas Meekins, servant number three, was on watch in the tower, even in this tumultuous storm, and caught that faint glare rushed down and got Captain Etheridge, told him of the situation. They knew that a ship was in trouble, and of course, they are going to respond, regardless of the co possible cost to themselves, risking all so that others might live. They got their equipment together and prepared themselves, and they threw open the boat room door, and as they went down the ramp, they sunk into the mire because what we know as storm surge today was happening at that time. The island was awash. You could not see where the Atlantic Ocean began and the Pamlico Sound ended. And they had no firm footing, yet they struggled for over an hour to get as close as they could to the wreck, the E.S. Newman, which had shoaled itself upon the sandbar. None of the equipment would work. They could not leave these people behind. The voice of glad and hearts was heard ringing from the vessel as those people recognized help was possibly there. Cap Captain Richard Etheridge decided to do something not in the record books, not in the blogs, but effective. He asked two of his strongest swimmers to step forward. They tied themselves together with heavy lines. Other long lines 
lines were tied to the back of them, and they had the gumption to jump into the surf with waves as high as a three-story house, and please, gentlemen, try as best you can to swim to the E.S. Newman. Oh, by the way, the reason two men were tied together is in case one of them drowned. <coughs> Nonetheless, they were victorious. In the distance, you can see the E.S. Newman. One of his masts is already snapped. And here we have two of the, uh, the surfmen from the Pea Island Station have already made their way to the vessel. And a heavy line is secured. They, in, in point, became the human breaches board. They were the means to get those people from that vessel to shore. And you see this little tiny face peeking out from over the shoulder of one of those lifesavers. The first person rescued off that vessel was Tommy Gardner, three years old. Every single person was rescued off of the E.S. Newman and brought back safely to the Pea Island Station. Tommy Gardner, three years old, eyes as big as saucers. What a happy day when they were all brought back together in the station. But Tommy Gardner was rescued, put back in his mother's arms as they made their way back home. Tommy Gardner lived. He grew up. He married. He had children. His children had children and so forth, which would not have happened had it not been for the men of the Pea Island crew. I have met the great-great-grandson of three-year-old Tommy Gardner. People, we are all connected. And without working together to save lives and to help each other in what our short time on Earth here allows us, we too can accomplish great things, just as the heroic men of the P.I. crew. Usually when stations when respond to something like this, they get accolades, pat on the back, awards. Unfortunately, that did not happen for the men of the P.I. crew, at least not yet. So as the locals conquered them the way out the storm, Richard Anthony and his crew went out into the storm. So we, here we have the Pea Island crew standing on the beach of the Island in front of the station that they built themselves. Frozen in time and whatever. Peter James' crew inspired others to follow their footsteps. So after the um, death of Richard Estridge, the station continued having African American keepers and crews for 67 years. <laughs> Until it closed in 1947. Wow. Uh, this picture, oh, this is uh, the picture to your left. Obviously, it would be Richard Etheridge and uh, the the men there during his tenure, and that's the last crew of the Pea Island Station. So they can Richard Etheridge can, can continue to inspire many many people and. Um, you all probably are aware that there's a Coast Guard cutter that is um, on the seas today named the United States Coast Guard cutter Richard Etheridge. Uh, that's uh, a picture taken during the commissioning of that uh, cutter, and it's in Port Everglades, Florida. Um, so hopefully we have taught you uh, something today. But I know, because I just know, I know we taught you three words, didn't we? And I want you to say those 